All right, let's go ahead and get started. We're going to be talking about OpenStack with containers. So LexD is a pure container hypervisor. It's um, machine containers. Let's you get a full, normal looking Linux environment inside of a container. <coughs> LexD was designed to be an API. So LexD was designed to be an API for containers. It currently only does the LXC containers, but there's nothing that would actually stop it from using any other kind of containers. It is an API that was designed. It didn't grow, or didn't grow organically. It was built from the ground up to be easy and secure. It's fast. <coughs> so Nova XD is almost zero overhead on top of running processes inside your host, or inside your host machine. So running on Metal, running in a Nova XD container, or LXD container, it's about the same. It's also secure. So Nova XD containers, LXD containers, are using all of the same technologies that everybody upstream using containers knows how to use to make things secure. C groups, et cetera. When people normally talk about containers, they talk about things like Docker and Rocket. And these are amazing technologies bringing fantastic innovations to application delivery, snapshotting, things like that. And then there's more hypervisors. They're VMware, Microsoft Hyper-V, KVM. It's actually down here that uh, LexD fits in. It isn't actually a full physical hypervisor, but it looks like one. From the inside, a LexD container looks exactly the same as a KVM instance. This allows you to do normal hypervisory things, like snapshotting, live migration. So Nova LexD is a full hypervisor for Nova using LexD containers instead of KVM containers. <coughs> Fits in right where you have in your current stack with your other hypervisors. And you can mix and match and do all of the kind of hypervisors in one cloud. You can do your normal hypervisor uh, actions, booting, rebooting, stopping, migrating them, resizing them. You can even do your uh, machine specifications. So we can restrict your Nova XD containers to a certain amount of CPU cores, certain amount of memory, certain disk I.O. networking. And if you decide that one of your machines is a bit too contended, you can move it. So let's actually see some of this. Of course, the most fun is that I'm doing it on two screens. So I have and it opens that cloud up. Of course, I should be show. Except apparently not. Am I getting lagged to my, it is, of course, it's lagging. There we go. <coughs> Boy. Yeah, a natural command that works. You can see we actually have LexD hypervisors. <laughs> I was playing around with uh, adding compute nodes to my cloud and taking them out again. That was just for me playing around with it yesterday and trying to see if I could actually get Kubernetes deploying on this particular Nova XD cloud. I didn't actually add enough capacity for it, so I decided to pull that one back a little bit. <coughs> so. We actually have a running instance. And of course, I managed to shift focus again. And we're inside of it. It has all of the normal things you'd expect to be running in a machine, which is kind of fun. I've got 
well, there are one core, <coughs> bit of memory. And then we even have a Cephlock device mounted at dev sdb. Now, because I don't trust any of you to take me at my word that that's actually a Ceph block device, let's go look at it. <laughs> yeah, maybe. So this is cinder volume attached to, of course, it's too high up there to see. It's attached to that same instance because it's still really awkward to see from there. We can look at that same uh, volume through the server shell. <coughs> I've got the attachment, and it works. That's shipped with Pike. So OpenStack Pike with Ubuntu Novel XD can actually mount and attach Ceph block devices. In Pike, we also shipped Ceph Luminous. So get all of the wonderful magic of Ceph Luminous in OpenStack Pike. So what are the actual differences between Metal, Novel XD, and KVM? So running the Spark Anomaly Detection benchmark in Hadoop, Bare Metal and Novel XD were very similar. It's about a 10% difference that seems to be mostly networking related. Uh, the bare metal test actually uses things like jumbo frames, while the Novel XD uses a um, <coughs> networking fabric with, a, what, a 1500 MTU. Nova KVM, not so fast. The TerraSort benchmark, when there's no contention, we can see that LexD and KVM both perform about the same. But when we start to add load to the underlying cloud, so we have more instances running, doing more things, the LexD performs fairly similarly, whereas the actual KVM instances start to contend more and more, and they conflict with each other as they have multiple different uh, kernels trying to schedule jobs. Novel XD, by sharing the actual host kernel, can take advantage of better scheduling and less contention. And that was way too fast. <laughs> <laughs> so, questions? Can you elaborate a little on the difference between LXD uh, and Docker? So in particular, does it use overlay file systems in every repository? Does it work on Windows and Mac? And uh, I'd happy, happily elaborate a bit. Uh, so LexD is a machine container. It looks like a full-on machine. It has syslog, cron, these normal services running. It's snapshotable, et cetera, just like you, uh, you might get from a Docker container. But it, um, <clears throat> it's fundamentally more like running a VM than running a Docker container. A Docker container is built to run one application and to run it well. A LexD container is built to be Linux. If you, if you think about it, you, the beautiful thing about we, 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 we talk about process containers, a, do, a Docker type. It, the beauty is the developer tells you this is exactly what I want you to run. And that is the beauty of process containers. But if you're in a traditional, more traditional um, operations paradigm, like you get, you know, think about it, you, you, you yourselves are running a large amount of software in the organization. Some of that software you've written yourself, some of it's coming from third party vendors, and you may not, when a critical <coughs> bug, an SSH vulnerability comes out, um, be able to contact that original <coughs> software development team immediately. Like you may not be in the sort of environment where you pick up the phone and you get a container within 30 minutes. So if you're in that more traditional <coughs> paradigm, but you want you want the, the density and the performance benefits of containers, the reason we think machine containers are interesting <coughs> is that you've got, you know. It's the same lightweight container, but we're just insisting that some of these additional processes that from an operations perspective are useful are always present in the container. It's still a shared kernel, so you can't do a Windows machine container on, um, on an Ubuntu, sorry, on a Linux kernel, 
um, you know, it's still got the, it is a container, it shares a kernel. But from an operations perspective, it, it is a more traditional working methodology. So we've done, I mean, I've, I've done a project at the bank where we, we converted several hundred applications in under a two month period, just moved them across to LexD. It says the Linux workloads, I want to containerize them, but I don't want to refactor them properly into a, um, into a, um, a process um, container format. Um, I don't want to rewrite the application. Using LexD is a sort of shortcut for that lift and shift process. But this, uh, if you run a lot of <coughs> the same uh, applications, like the same VMs, you run them in containers, then I'm, as you showed, it will be more efficient, it will scale better with the number of instances. Yes. If you run a lot of different <coughs> OSs, different systems in containers on the same machine, is that, isn't it then almost the same as? Yes, remember, I mean, the great news about containers is density and performance. The bad news about them is it just doesn't address cross, um, you know, what would, Windows on, on the Linux is, I say, a part of the story. But it's worth calling out that performance. We've got some performance data there, but just to, to think about it. If the workloads are not running, you can probably, actually, this machine's probably a bit beefy, but my... It's my, very beefy. My, 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 my laptop will probably won't run 12, 14 VMs. Get 500 LexD instances up and running on the same machine, and the performance difference is about 20%. So, you know, when you've got a hypervisor, there is a performance impact. So we see, um, so it doesn't solve your operating system on a different operating system problem, but it, once you've made the decision to containerize, what we would encourage people to think about is both process containers. Look, we're all in on Docker. 70% of it's based on Ubuntu. We love it. But also think about machine containers as another tool in your toolbox for lift and shift. Yeah, but just technically there shouldn't be any reason why you would want to be able to run a Linux container on Windows because if in fact Docker is almost the same. I mean the, the Docker concept is, is the success of Docker I think is mainly because it appeals to developers. Yeah. Any developer on Windows, Mac or Linux can just download it and use sure. it. And that's the reason why it takes off. And now if you have this technology and you want developers to use it, you should also support that on Windows and Mac. Uh, in the same way, I mean, uh, technically it's possible. Why not? So do you know how Docker supports Linux, using Mac, Windows. and Windows? <coughs> it does, it, then, using the native ones. Right, so they, they wrote a tool to yeah. start a VM with Hyper-V or Beehive and then run your Docker container or your Docker commands for there. I think you should do exactly the same it, it, because it helps the technology. It's uh, nothing, there's nothing stopping you running LexD <coughs> on top of a hypervisor or another OS. It's just that some of the performance benefits that you would have seen, now you've got a hypervisor in there, so they evaporate. So you can still have, you can still do that, but, but you, it's not a lot, it's not necessarily a logical thing to do. You can, but you might not. Just two questions, then. What is the big difference whether you would have removed from the hypervisor level that you have the big gain for LXD and what are the limitations the LXD containers have compared to Rock to Docker? I can share a bit of that one. So um, some of the benefits that you get over a traditional hypervisor is that you are sharing a kernel. So all of the scheduling that happens, happens one time, rather than on the host and again in the guest hypervisor, or in the guest kernel. That lets you actually get the performance density that we saw, you know, so you can actually do things. Because you're using it to a single scheduler. There's a single scheduler going on, which also means there's only a single kernel running. So your memory, all of your CPU resources for the kernel, only one time. So if you're in anybody here in H doing either high performance compute, finance, or telco workloads, anybody in the room? Yeah, I mean, okay, so that, that's a use case where this really makes it, or if you're also in, um, if you're doing oil and gas, so if you're doing an HPC where you're, you're um, uh, doing seismic analysis, this makes a huge difference um, on that front. And the constraint is that you don't get the benefit of doing it cross OS. Well, another cost to it is that you actually must share that host kernel, which usually is fine, but it means you can't do things like loading kernel modules. Most workloads don't actually need to load kernel modules, but if you do, that's a limitation.
So telco use cases where you're doing BPDK, like high, really very, very large network throughput, because you basically need a good solution underneath the open stack to give you the right level of performance. Another use case, which is kind of counterintuitive, is um, we think about containers as a way of taking one computer, you know, one, one unit of compute, and splicing it up as thin as possible. That's fundamentally what a container is doing. You can also do sort of a slight, slight um, uh, inversion moment. You can actually use full machine containers to take over the whole machine, but offer it up to internal user like a VM. So you can, because there's no performance overhead, you can say, I'll put one container down on a whole machine, and I'll make it available to one tenant. Um, and the advantage there is that tenant doesn't actually gain access to the BIOS. So if you've been running an environment where an internal tenant, or if you're running a business and it's, it's a managed hosting business, the truth is when people get access to that machine, they they get access to the machine and right the way down to BIOS level. And from a security perspective, when you take it back, you really don't know what's happened. It's very, almost un, un... It is impossible for you really to secure that machine. Um, because of what somebody codes onto the BIOS. Using full machine containers allows someone to have access to a full machine, but you can then recycle it with the full knowledge that you've got great security story, and with the knowledge that you can snapshot workloads on it when it's running. Um, so another example, a real use case, um, do a project with a bank where they have 6,000 cores that are used every night to calculate their, their risk, but the risks on their book. Okay. So they literally, they stop trading at whatever, um, 1800 CET, it's a European bank. They then have to take a look at all their positions and then they run a Monte Carlo risk solution overnight. It normally takes four to five hours. If there's a problem, they have to start the whole thing again. They um, use this combined with MAS, Metal as a Service, which is another open source like bare metal provisioning tool, to do two things. One is, if in that scenario, there's a break in the multi uh, the, in, the, in the risk analysis because they are snapshotting. They don't have to rerun the whole thing again. They can just click, go back. They've taken a snapshot. They, they continue the analysis from there. Um, and then, sorry, side point, but I'll make it anyway. Because um, there was a question earlier about how long does it take to, take to set up OpenStack? They literally every morning then repurpose about a third of that estate to make it available as general compute in the organisation. <coughs> every morning and every night, they take that estate and change the usage. Now that once you put the automation at scale, that's the, the fluidity that you can get with the with results. Other questions on the next piece? I digress. Um, I'm uh, I'm interested in uh, the security comparison between LXD and Docker. So I read Docker is insecure, and it's a uh, is I don't know why. <coughs> <per se. laughs> can you uh, elaborate on that? Uh, I would I would probably go with anything can be insecure. With a Docker container, you can pretty much opt out of all the security. You can do the same thing with a LexD container. LexC containers by default don't have any security, which is what both of these technologies build on. Um, in terms of security against it, I don't know a huge well, amount. Things I'm, I'm hearing is that the, the Docker daemon is running as root, and uh, anyone uh, that has access to the Docker daemon can actually uh, Stuff. So actually, that's a kind of fun one. Generally, the user gets added to the LexD user. Not quite. A u regular user doesn't actually have the permission to create a privileged LexD container. So I can create containers on my laptop all day long. But if I want to create a cr privileged container, which has full access to the host, can do all of the magic that you can do on the host, I have to actually have root. Okay. Because I have to have permission to modify the C groups to do that. Yeah. Otherwise. Probably. <laughs> okay, it's, worth, it's worth thinking about where, where this always work started. I mean, the, the LexD project is just the continuation of, of Linux container groups. Um, and bizarrely, when we were looking, at, I, I'm not. This is not an anti-Susan comment, but I have to smile. Susan was suggesting they might be doing um, ARM servers in their next announcement. When we started doing ARM servers six years ago. Uh, one of the conditions we're working with ARM, and ARM said we want to get virtualization running on ARM processors. There was no support for KVM in the ARM processors. And we were sort of thinking, how do we do this? And it was just at the time that IBM had sort of stopped investing, or just starting to stop investing 
starting to stop. Stop investing in Lex C. We hired that team who'd led the Linux container project out of IBM to lead the development of Lex C to bring it to ARM. And then as we looked at it more and more, you know, and we were looking at documents, and actually there is this use case um, where machine containers come from. That, that's actually the origin of the project um, six, seven years ago. But this is very much a natural evolution of everything you've got with Lexi. It's just putting a daemon on it and then trying to think about how could you make a container behave like a daemon. I have a question. Uh, as you said, uh, how simple is the networking uh, within the containers? And uh, as you suggested, the DPDK, how we can share the uh, physical uh, networking spaces or uh, how we can integrate the DPDK um, with the containers. Mm -hmm. And one more question. Um, this, uh, or I forgot. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> two good questions to start with. Uh, so on the first part of that, um, how simple is the networking between containers? It's a host bridge. So it ends up bridged onto the host network. Generally, I mean, you can configure your OpenStack network in all sorts of ways. Um, but it is. It's full OpenStack networking right into the container. It's mounted on the host and passed in as a device to the container. Okay. So what you can do with a KVM, pretty much you can do with a Novel XD container. It supports a SRIUV kind of step? Uh, I believe so. The you can get, you can, <coughs> look, everything, uh, everything that we do with AT&T, Deutsche Telekom, all the customers we've had open that in production for now four plus years. You know, some of these customers are doing um, well, easily north of five, 6,000 servers, multiple data centers. Um, we have been able to get SROs, V support, and DVDK support. All of that's based on XP. So I can't give you the technical answer to it, but I do know that we are doing it with customers live okay. in production and have been in production with our workers on top for a while. Mm -hmm. And uh, what about the value migration of the containers uh, to the system? I mean, without uh, losing a ping, let's say, uh, how is that? Uh, how simple is that uh, to achieve the migration of co complete containers to another system? As in, can you migrate <coughs> workloads without dropping packets? Yeah. Yes. Um, how it's done, I do not know, but I know that we've got one, one large US carrier, I can't mention, I haven't, met, I haven't mentioned, um, who, for whom that was the actual, uh, the, the evaluation of the whole um, proof of value project was, could we do an upgrade to, uh, this was a cart of this project was about six months ago, um, without dropping a packet, and I know that we were able to do that, but I don't know the answer how. <laughs> <laughs> Magic. <laughs> yeah, um, does it need uh, hardware virtualization support? LexD, does that need hardware uh, virtualization support? I don't think so. Uh, like KVM? No. That's it, it shouldn't. You're, I mean, you're literally running on the host kernel. Yeah, it's, just, it's just running. <coughs> so you don't need it. No. I mean, you probably have it, but you probably don't need yeah, okay. it. But this is an interesting question around security, and this is actually partly into the Docker. There's a question earlier about Docker. I mean, when we talk about security, there are lots of security issues generally in these infrastructures, and, and, and there are some specific ones in the containers. But fundamentally, is you've got two tenants, and if they want to access the kernel, do they get to to, to just grab as much compute or, or memory as they want? Um, I think we are going to see, and Intel have done some really interesting work around the Clear Container project, of taking some of the security, um, the in silicon security locks for particular parts of memory access, and that will make its way, I don't know the timing of that, but over the next sort of 18, 24 months, that will, that, that work. One of the challenges in silicon is it all got designed four years ago and then gets made a year ago and then it's the machine you can buy. But what we're now seeing is some of the KVMs, uh, <coughs> hardware silicon uh, uh, basics are now are now being reused and attached to both either clear containers or Docker or, or Lexi. So we are going to see an improvement in the hardware lockdown of the containers. Okay. I have a question, something totally different. One of the uh, attractive parts of Docker is you fire up any distribution of any Linux or wherever, you type install, app get, yum, vf, whatever, Docker, and you have Docker. Is it also true for LXD? Or is it just reboot? You can do all of them. I mean, I could probably do it, but it might be a little iffy. But I can actually spin up CentOS, anything. It, it doesn't matter, as long as it's fine with the kernel. I mean, 
not running CentOS in LXD, I mean running LXD in CentOS. I know it's in uh, Debian. I know it's actually upstream in Debian. I don't know. No, it's not. It should be. No, we need a solution to Snap. <laughs> OK, Snap's upstream in Debian. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know the status of LexD support. There's nothing, um, in a sense, there, there's nothing stopping it happening. I, I don't know the, the status. In the end, the funny thing about containers generally is um, they don't actually, if you look at the kernel, they don't really exist. I mean, what a container decides is there are some processes in the, can, in the kernel that I will decide to treat this way, but the kernel itself doesn't have a concept of a container. The, um, so there's nothing stopping this being used by other no, the, distributions. I just don't believe that work has been done. But the, do you see do you see this technology as being used by only the infrastructure people or also by developers? I use it all the time as a developer. Yeah, because the developers they it's don't work so on Ubuntu. <laughs> they work on usually they work on Windows and they work on Mac. Uh, me and my colleague we work on CentOS. And the, the strength of Docker is that any developer can use it and you can do Docker run, CentOS 7, enter, it will download the image, run it, so the, the whole developer experience is so smooth. And that's the reason why it's successful. So you can have the best technology of, of all time, but if you, you have to think of the developer experience if you want them to use it. So you should not think <coughs> that this is something anti or against Docker. Mm -hmm. Process and machine containers are both going to exist over the next 10 years. And, and Docker will be wildly successful. So don't, they're just, it's an additional tool, especially if you're doing lift and shift on more traditional applications. And we don't want to refactor the app. It's a very useful way of, of doing that. And if you're running OpenStack itself, LexD is a, like, it's how we, how we recommend and how we take all of our large production customers <coughs> to production and have done for years now. It has been the secret behind live upgrades and, and the whole ton of other stuff that people thought was magic two years ago. This was the underlying driver of it. One well, final question then. then. Has the, the question is indeed for the developer experience. But if, at the end, it's building the container that's important. I mean, the developer can use whatever he wants to develop his application on. How hard is it then if, they, for example, I have an application built, I create my Docker container and have that application built. Now I'm, I want to create a container that runs on LXD. Is, is there a big difference? I mean, there are a few limitations so you have to keep aware of, but say they're, they're met. How hard is it then to, to build the container? They're very different perspectives. So you, people, when Docker started, people did things like running Chef to provision a Docker container. That's generally not seen as a best practice anymore. That would make perfect sense in LexD because you have a Linux machine. But once you have built the container, you can take an image of it, you can snapshot it, take it, move it around, deploy it everywhere. I actually have an app at my house right now that I did that just for fun the other day. It's a LexD container, snapshot it, move it around. I have the same container running on several machines. You build it the way you build a VM. You don't build it like a Docker container. But beyond that, it's still a container. You can move it around, <coughs> start it anywhere. And we've got a minute left. Quick questions. Hmm? Roadmap on Novel XD specifically. Um, there's a couple of wish list items around actually booting from Ceph block devices. Currently, you have to use local store and then you can attach Ceph block devices. Um, I don't know of any other major changes on the roadmap for it. Yeah, I think the, 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 the mission is to create density and performance of containers for the manageability of a VM. It's you know, the last thought I've in our last 30 seconds to leave you with is we see this as not a replacement for process containers in any way. Um, you know, we are building very large full Docker uh, enterprise edition clouds for large customers in the US and Kubernetes on Docker instances. We're going to see this as another, another tool set. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.